Good morning and good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Johnstone, Senior Advisor and Japan Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you for joining us for what is sure to be a very timely uh, and interesting discussion on the current dynamics in Japanese politics. Uh, after a busy summer of diplomacy, including the trilateral US-Japan-South Korea summit at Camp David, uh, the ASEAN East Asia summit, uh, and most recently the G20 summit in, in, in India, Prime Minister Kishida has returned home, but faces domestic political headwinds in the lead up to a new session of parliament. In a bid to revive public support and build policy momentum for his agenda, overnight Prime Minister Kishida announced a cabinet shuffle uh, and some changes to senior positions in the Liberal Democratic Party. I would love to tell our audience that the CSIS Japan chair knew weeks ago exactly when the shuffle would take place and scheduled this event accordingly, uh, but I'll admit that that would be something of a stretch. Uh, but in any event, joining me today to explore the outlook for the Kishida administration, the state of the ruling coalition between the LDP and the Komeito, and prospects for a future election, as well as the impact of all of this on Japan's foreign policy, are two really outstanding guests, Ms. Keiko Izuka and Dr. Leonard Chopa. Uh, Keiko Izuka is a senior political writer with the Yomiuri Shimbun, as well as lead commentator for the nightly news program Shinso News, News in Depth, which delves into both domestic and international news. She also previously was chief editor of international news and Washington bureau chief, as well as uh, a chief political correspondent at the prime minister's office in Japan. So she brings really a unique insider perspective on domestic political affairs, and we're delighted to have her. Keiko, welcome. Uh, also joining us is Dr. Leonard Chopa, who is a professor of politics at the University of Virginia, specializing in politics uh, and the political economy of Japan in a comparative context. He is one of the leading experts on Japanese politics in the United States. He has co-authored and edited several books, including The Evolution of Japanese Party Politics, and so he's sure to have some great insights on the current state of politics in Japan and the stability of the ruling coalition uh, and related issues. So welcome, Len. Um, I'll first invite each of them to offer some opening thoughts on the political state of play. Um, we'll begin with uh, Keiko, who, is, who will give us her take on the cabinet shuffle and what it means for the Kishida administration. Uh, and then I'll welcome Len to comment on, on uh, some broader coalition dynamics and the, challenge, the challenges that Kishida faces in preparing for a snap election. Um, for the audience, at the end of our discussion, we'll have some time for, for Q&A. Please note that the chat function is disabled on this call. You can ask a question by going to the event page on our website and clicking Ask Live Questions at the bottom, uh, which will take you to a Q&A submission form. So thank you for uh, following all of that. Um, so Keiko, first to you. Uh, this turned out to be a somewhat more consequential cabinet shuffle than at least I expected a few days ago. 11 new members of the cabinet. I wasn't expecting, for example, uh, that both the foreign and the defense ministers would be replaced. Um, welcome your thoughts uh, on the shuffle and and anything more that you would like to say at the outset. Uh, so over to you, Keiko. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm Keiko from uh, Tokyo, a very steamy and hot uh, evening uh, in Tokyo. And uh, so uh, Kishida went for uh, a reshuffle uh, of uh, the cabinet and the LDP uh, today. And uh, but unfortunately, uh, there's another big news today. That is that Kim Jong Un has just held a summit meeting with Putin in Russia. So people in Japan may be paying more attention to the Russo North, North Korean summit rather than Kishida to reshuffle. But uh, but I will now uh, focus on uh, the reshuffle uh, side. And uh, so having said that, the basic framework of the administration was maintained and the prime minister insisted on a sense of renewal and novelty and uh, uh, some kind of a factional balance. And uh, having said that, I would like to uh, focus on five points uh, as a, a opening uh, remarks. 
which are uh, hold on. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, Kishida's aim for the reshuffle, number one. And number two, changes in the balance of power within the LDP. And number three, LDP Komeito, uh, the, this is a, a coalition relationship. Uh, and number four, uh, uh, re, is there going to be a reorganization of coalition, uh, meaning the DPFP or Ishin? And number five, uh, the prospects for general election. And I will uh, be try to be uh, very quick. Uh, and so, uh, and, to, and to be brief. Uh, and so to start with, uh, um, the basic framework of the administration was maintained and the uh, uh, meaning that uh, Matsuno, uh, Chief Cabinet Secretary Matsuno and uh, Finance Minister Miyazawa and on the party side, Vice President Aso and the Secretary General Motegi, you know, those uh, main figures uh, were maintained, except for uh, foreign minister, which was uh, a bit of surprise. Uh, foreign minister Hayashi went out, and instead, a uh, 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 female, uh, former uh, justice minister, uh, Kamikawa, uh, was appointed as foreign minister. And as for female uh, 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 ministers, there are uh, record uh, five uh, uh, members. That's a record tie. And the uh, first cabinet appointment uh, counted 11. So uh, that's, I think, that what Kishida uh, wanted to impress Japanese people, that he went for something new. And he, he just held a uh, press conference and announced that this cabinet is a, a cabinet for new era competition. And he will... Uh, 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 intend to uh, this cabinet into a turning change into power. So that's his slogan uh, he just announced. Okay, so uh, going for Kishida's aim, uh, I think that uh, number one, so uh, this reshuffle was the result of working, uh, result of um, thinking about the LDP presidential election uh, that's going to be held uh, next year, autumn. So uh, Kishida's main focus was to put the party in a state of uh, gaining victory, almost uncontested. So he, he his this kind this reshuffle was to prepare for uh, the um, presidential election uh, to make it uncontested. And number two, uh, so the main focus was to in order to achieve that uh, uh, aim. Uh, the focus was how to deal with the Secretary General Motegi, uh, who shows his clear ambition to become the next prime minister. So I think that uh, Kishida uh, thought two ways, I think, number one, in, in dealing with Motegi. So number one, uh, let him run uh, next year and squash him in the competition. And number two, uh, just don't let him run. And so uh, I think uh, this week, uh, Kishida chose the second choice, meaning that just don't let him run. So keep him in, in the uh, party leadership and then, uh, but he, he uh, keep it, keep, keep him in the cage. And, uh, and to explain this situation, I think that uh, this Kishida uh, administration's uh, politics uh, structure, the political map, is I I I think that it's changing. Uh, it's it's usually being said for maybe past a year uh, uh, as a triumvirate uh, tri politics, and uh, it's led by uh, Kishida. Uh, the factions of Kishida and Aso and Motegi. And, but I think in reality, it's changing into uh, Kishida, Aso, and Hagyuda. Hagyuda is a, a member of, uh, one of the leaders in the Abe faction. And he's now a head of the Policy Research Council. And he, he is re, uh, 
renamed ASO. So um, the, the reason why I say this is that um, Motegi is, uh, has shown too much uh, ambition. So uh, I don't think that uh, Kishida does not like that very much. So uh, I think that ASO, it's, as ASO is a vice president and the former uh, finance minister and the leader of the ASO faction. Uh, he is now uh, trying to uh, uh, tame Motegi, do not run. And then at the same time, he also admitted uh, Obuchi, he, who is a from the same faction from Motegi. And uh, so uh, he, Motegi is sort of a, in, a, in a case, he, he, he can be a secretary general, he can be a very uh, perform as a secretary general, but he will be kept in cage. And, uh, and meanwhile, uh, the, the biggest faction of Abe, a uh, hundred member, member is hundred people. Uh, um, you know, Abe faction has been recently, after Abe's death, uh, recently lightly, you know, taken lightly because uh, of some confusion of not being able to choose the leader. But it is becoming more and more obvious that this faction is practically taking the leadership. Uh, in fact, uh, Kishida uh, consulted Hagiuda uh, on Monday twice to consult with uh, this reshuffle and and we all know that behind Hagiuda, uh, there's a former prime minister, Mori, who used to be the leader of this faction. I think that, uh, and uh, if you look at this reshuffle, uh, what Mori said, Mori is already retired, but he's still influential after Abe's death. And what uh, uh, Mori said was almost uh, accepted by Kishida in this reshuffle. Uh, including uh, Obuchi's appointment. So I think this, uh, inside the LDP, I think there's a power chain, power shift from uh, uh, Kishida, uh, Aso, or Motegi, you know, triumvirate, to uh, Kishida, Aso, or uh, Abe faction meaning Hagiuda and Mori will be influential. So uh, having said that, uh, I think this, um, is there going to be any change to uh, to the relationship with Komeito? I think, you know, there was some uh, uh, fighting between LDP and Komeito, uh, but, uh, you know, before summer, but they uh, reunited on September 4th, last Monday, uh, formally agreed to revive electoral cooperation in Tokyo uh, for the next election. So I think uh, relation was uh, restored. And the important thing is that this benefits the Kishida LDP side, but uh, there's also a sense of crisis on the Komeito side. And it's if you look at cl uh, closely the relationship, I think it was Komeito who wanted to resume uh, the revived relationship. According to uh, a recent internal LDP survey, uh, in the next election, all parties will lose seats, except for Ishin, the reformation uh uh, Ishin party. And of course, the LDP will win relatively, but uh, lose some seats. And the, the more, uh, I think uh, Komeito has, uh, Komeito is feeling uh, more anxiety because, um, because according to uh, the recent survey, uh, it might lose seats in the strongholds of Tokyo and Osaka. So it's Komeito uh, that needs uh, LDP's uh, support and help. So, so having said that, 
I think uh, the the LDP and COMETO relationship uh, uh, will uh, uh, be maintained, not to maybe not too enthusiastically, but it will be maintained. Uh, and uh, one reason for that is that the Kishida is uh, has uh, re realized that Komeito's support is really necessary in order to uh, uh, it, for him to uh, win the second term next uh, next year, because he will have to win the election uh, by all means in order to uh, win the second term. So uh, I, I think Kishida has uh, keenly realized that uh, Komeito should not be neglected. And number four, uh, uh, if there is a, a reorganization of coalition, uh, the timing of, uh, it's interesting to point out that the timing of the reshuffle was what well, had been fluid until just the beginning of last week. And up until then, there was a debate about whether to include the DPFP, the Democratic Party for the people, led by Tamaki in the coalition. It's a small party, but um, um, but it has uh, about uh, 10 seats in upper house. And the LDP does not have a majority in the upper house. So it has always have to uh, depend on, rely on Komeito and uh, to counterbalance that, you know, the solely relying on Komeito party, uh, there are some uh, arguments that um, the LDP should have some more other options. And that was the Democratic Party for the people. So, uh, but uh, I think, uh, but it was not easy. Because um, uh, the DPFP has a trade union, you know, has trade unions in its support base. So it's not uh, easy. It, it was not an easy discussion. But the initial plan was that if the DPFP were to join the coalition at this time, the date for the reshuffle was set to be at the end of September. But uh, but uh, Kishida uh, has given up, and that was, in the end, not immediately possible. So the date was moved up and came today. So uh, the date uh, uh, was decided uh, because of this kind of um, DPFP, you know, under the table uh, uh, discussion. Uh, but it, so perhaps it might come back uh, in the near future because Tamaki is really. He, positive about this but the, the trade unions uh it, it's a it, the discussion with trade un, union will not be that easy and i do not foresee the Isin participating in the coalition in the near future uh, unless the current ldp komeito coalition ends up uh going under the majority in the next election i don't think that you know the ldp and komeito would will be uh, interested. And Ishin is not that interested uh, at all at this moment. And number five, uh, uh, about the, uh, the next election. Uh, Kishida may still decide to go for the general election before the end of this year, uh, after issuing a package of economic measures and uh, some other uh, budgetary uh, aids to the people uh, because of um, uh, high energy prices and so forth. Uh, but uh, it will depend on two things, uh, maybe the public uh, opinion polls and the performance of the newly, uh, of the cabinets during the uh, diet. Uh, the, you know, they are going to have to uh, do the Q&A session uh, smoothly without gaffes and but considering that you know there are eleven new ministers, and uh, so that that might be uh, uh, risky. And the Yomiuri Shimbun, uh, I my newspaper is now conducting an opinion poll, 
and will report the results uh, in a rush the day after tomorrow. So it's going to be Friday. So uh, Kishida will first know the results or the impact or if you know if it, it, it was effective in boosting his supporting rate. Uh, so if it's good, he might go for election, uh, but you, you'll never know. The one thing is clear is that he has not ruled out uh, the possibility of going for election uh, before the end of this year. So I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you, Keiko. That was terrific. You gave us a lot. I love your framing of uh, of Kishida putting Motegi in a cage. It brings to mind that that <laughs> adage of uh, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Um, so the very interesting portrayal there. And we'll certainly look forward to the results of the Yomiuri poll on Friday. But uh, Len, let me let me uh, turn to you. Let's um, maybe step back a little bit. Uh, what are your opening thoughts on the the state of the coalition and the issues that that unite and divide them. Over to you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I really appreciated Keiko's up to the minute reporting on what's happening behind the scenes as this uh, cabinet reshuffle happens. I think what I can contribute is to put a lot of what she reported to you in a little bit more of a, a context, uh, especially for members of the audience who are not as familiar with Japanese politics and haven't been following it closely. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing a slide that I use um, in my classroom um, to give um, students a, a sense of who are the major figures in Japanese politics. So this chart is organized so that the longer a prime minister serves, the bigger their picture becomes. Okay, And you can immediately see that there are two whales um, in the last 20 years, Koizumi and Abe, and then there's a bunch of minnows um, and uh, Prime ministers that mostly lasted just one year. Obviously, Kishida aspires to be the next whale, um, and he's only grown slightly um, with his amount of time in office so far. And so that's the kind of context in which um, the, the maneuvering that you heard about from Keiko is happening. For him to become a whale, he needs to prevail in two different contests. The LDP leadership contest is scheduled for next September, so a year from now and a lower house election that has to be held before September, well, actually October um, 2025. And, um, but that is flexible. It can happen at any time, as Keiko mentioned. And usually prime ministers do not want to wait to the very last minute when they have very little control about what's happening in the world. Better to call the timing when, you're, when it's as advantageous as possible. So uh, Kishida is going to be looking for that moment that could come as early as this later this fall, but also could happen in the spring or summer next year. And ideally, he uh, holds an election at, at, a, at a good time, does well enough that nobody can challenge him in the le leadership election next September. So the next chart um, shows you, hopefully you can see the full chart um, underneath the pictures of people. But um, it shows you um, the history of public opinion polls. Um, I'm sorry, Keiko, that I'm using the Asahi data here. Um, the most recent uh, data shows that uh, Kishida's popularity rating is at 33% in the Asahi series. Um, Yomiuri's uh, most recent number, I think, was uh, 35%, so not that different. And what all of the polls are showing is that Kishida had a bump going um, up until last spring, where he was, was building up his support. I think the public appreciated what he was doing on defense policy and in foreign policy, his ability to maneuver toward good relations with the United States and improved relations with Korea. Um, and these were among the things that were giving him a boost. And there was some expectation that he would uh, use the extra boost he hoped to get from hosting the G7 in Japan to um, have the best possible moment to hold a early election that he could do uh, very well and secure his hold on power. But that moment passed this summer. He didn't get the boost that he thought from the G7 and all the other diplomatic events that uh, Chris mentioned at the start. Um, but instead, um, the public seems to be frustrated by uh, inflation, which is being fed by a weak yen, so that the 
gasoline prices are at, at record levels, so, you know, going up um, to 185 yen per liter. Um, that's a very visible um, sign that Japan is having inflation. But I think for the audience to appreciate, Japan had many, many years of no inflation and actually worrying about deflation. Many of the prices of items that you buy at the convenience store to um, a few a year ago were roughly the same price as what you paid 30 years ago. So Japanese people are used to paying exactly the same price for many items. And so seeing as a result of uh, recent inflation and the weakening of the yen, these long familiar prices starting to go up is a bit of a shock and, um, and has contributed to his losing some popular support. So why does he care so much about popular support? Because when the LDP, there are two things that can happen to Kishida that will end his tenure. Um, one is to lose an election. And of course, um, a, all, all political systems, the uh, popularity of the leader has a big effect on how a party performs. Um, in Japan, this didn't used to be as important um, because um, there were all kinds of other factors that affected who how people voted very clientelistically. But since the reforms adopted uh, 30 years ago, um, Japan is is now much more of a, person, a system where the prime minister's popularity drives a lot of vote results. And so the LDP is very aware of this. And look at the past times that the support rating for prime ministers dipped to a rate near 33%. One of the times it happened was right at the end of Abe's tenure. It was one of the reasons he finally stepped aside and allowed Asuga to come in. And Suga started, as many Japanese prime ministers do, with very high popular support ratings when they first come in. And then he just steadily lost support over the entire time of his tenure. Once again, when he reached around 33%, he was replaced because the LDP knew it was going into an election and it wanted to get the boost from choosing a new leader. So they chose Kishida right before the last election. They used that boost um, to perform quite well at the 2021 election. And that's the history that Kishida is dealing with. He knows that if he stays at anywhere near 33% through next summer, the LDP is going to replace him at that September leadership election, hoping to do a repeat of what they did in 2021, perhaps with Mr. Motegi. Um, but it is just amazing to me that the Japanese people routinely reward any new face with a book, big popularity boost. Um, and almost without fail, they, they can count on this. And so the LDP has used it. So a next uh, a, a framing that I want everyone to have is the recent success of the LDP in elections. So this chart shows the elections um, over, over um, about 20 year period. You can see for the last four elections going back to 2012, uh, the elections contested under Abe and then under Kishida, the LDP has, has uh, won comfortable majorities. Given the current number of diet seats, you just need 233 seats to hold a majority in the lower house. So the LDP has had comfortable majorities um, for over a decade. And unfortunately, that sets a high bar for Kishida. Um, he has to try to keep this up um, and, and perform similarly um, to hold on to his job. Um, also important to know is that the Komeito, shown in blue here, um, adds their seeds to the coalition total. So the coalition is, is in, um, even more than the LDP itself, the coalition has had very comfortable majorities for over a decade. And um, I agree completely with um, Keiko that the coalition is looking uh, stable again now after some um, tensions um between Kometo and the LDP, but now they have uh, sorted all of that out. They will be supporting each other at the next election and not, there, nothing's going to happen to to break them up before the next election. So we can talk about what might happen afterwards um, later. So also just a little context, you can see that um, um, let's see, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, the major opposition to the LDP was the DPJ the Democratic Party of Japan. Uh, they were challenging enough that they won a landslide election in 2009. And, um, but since their, their time in office, 
uh, which included the triple disaster of 2011 and the aftermath of that, the DPJ uh, split and has lost a whole lot of its popularity. The, the main remainder of that former party is the Constitutional Democratic Party of Japan. To me, it was amazing that Keiko gave her whole presentation, did not even mention the CDPJ. Um, they are the leading opposition party in the diet at the moment. They have more seats than anybody but the LDP. Um, so we should take them somewhat seriously, um, but they are not doing well in popularity lately. Um, and Ishida with that 41 seat number there from 2021, that is the party that LDP is keeping an eye on now. So how what's gonna happen at this next election? So another piece of context is what's the popularity level for the different parties going into the next election. So this survey is from Nikkei, again, not the Yomiuri, um, um, but we uh, this uh, news organization pulled uh, voters to find out uh, which party they would vote for with their proportional representation ballots, where they have to choose a party. And you can see that the LDP is heads and shoulders way more popular than any other party, 34% is not a bad rate of popularity for the LDP. It has been higher um, during the best years of the Abe administration. You might get popularity ratings of 40% for the LDP, and it's a little bit down from that, but um, this is still way better than any, any other party. Now, if Ishin and the Constitutional Democratic Party were cooperating 12 plus nine, um, that would be a, a 21, right? Uh, you, maybe you could start to see some competition for the LDP in single member districts, but these two parties are not cooperating. They are competing to be the top opposition party. Uh, both parties have basically set the bar for themselves that we want to be the top opposition party to the LDP. So this is exactly where Kishida wants these parties to be if, he, if he's going to have a big advantage from the absence of cooperation among the opposition parties at the next election. Also, you can see Komeito's support level there is not that significant. You might be wondering, why does the LDP care so much about a party that only pulls 3%? So background to that is that even though they have a, um, a, a relatively small group of supporters, they are very loyal and they will follow the directions of the party leadership. And so during the 20 years of the coalition between the LDP and the Kome party, every election, the Kome voters turn out everywhere that the Kome itself is not running for a single member district, they vote for the LDP. And this contributes to the LDP voting margin in many urban seats where the LDP would not be comfortable without these Kome supporters. So um, that's why it has been very important to keep this coalition together. So the, the next uh, point is, is there any scenario in which the LDP could lose? Okay, this is a very hypothetical situation, but it's at least going worth going through thinking about why, um, what is the scenario in which the LDP could do so badly that it would lose a majority in the lower house? So to get us a, a feel for that, it's useful to go back to the last time that happened in 2009. Um, what happened in 2009, number one, was that there was a single party, the DPJ, that was the only obvious alternative to the LDP all across the country. So the LDP had to run with Kometo, the coalition, ran against the DPJ head-to-head uh, -head in almost every seat. And given the uh, difficulties that LDP was facing at the time, they had an imploding economy. Um, they had changed prime ministers repeatedly. They had no strong leadership figures. Um, the voters, especially unaffiliated voters, people who were not loyal to the DPJ, but thought the LDP was doing badly, turned out in large numbers and voted for the only alternative available, which was the DPJ. And given the, the fact that they, they didn't need to figure out who is the leading opposition, it was right there and obvious in front of them, the DPJ ran on a slogan, uh, time for a change of party, a change of government. Uh, the LDP had been running things forever, and they delivered on that promise um, by changing the government and bringing in fresh faces. 
Um, so that's a scenario that the LDP might need to worry about. Um, are they still so the highlight, the circle on this chart shows where they lost large numbers of seats in 2009. And these are the prefectures of the Tokyo metro area and the Osaka metro area and in between, the densely populated Pacific coast, um, bigger cities. These are the places where the LDP does not have a large base of loyal LDP supporters. They might have 33%, uh, the 34% you saw in that poll across the country, but in many urban areas, it's like 20%, 25% LDP supporters. So they are vulnerable if one alternative emerges and the LDP is blamed for doing poorly in their leadership. Um, and so they lost big in these urban areas. What's happening lately? So uh, this chart, um, shows the 2021 election when Kishida um, prevailed. And you can see quite a sharp difference in colors. I know um, I tried to show the uh, this in a color uh, uh, key so that you can see the, that the, the blue um, Democratic Party um, has performed horribly in these urban areas since 2009. Um, the LDP plus Kometo and especially the popularity of the leadership of Prime Minister Abe was sufficient that the LDP could win um, majorities against divided opposition um, between a couple of alternative parties that were presented to the voters in single member districts. And most places, the LDP um, won lots of seats in these urban areas last time and probably will win again if the Ishin and the Democratic Party uh, continue to, to compete against each other and not co uh, cooperate on running a single candidate against the LDP. So the one place urban er, in urban areas where the LDP did not do as well last time was Osaka. And you can see the light blue color there are the seats won by Ishin. Ishin almost sweep, swept the single member districts in Osaka in the nightmare for the LDP um, to the extent they're losing any sleep about the next election is that somehow Ishin would take off across the country and do something similar to what they did in Osaka in other urban areas. Um, notice that the only uh, coalition party that won seats in Osaka is Kometo. So even though those are red to show that they're coalition seats, those are not LDP seats. They are four Kometo seats. And they prevailed because the LDP ran with Kometo in those seats. And Ishin voluntarily uh, opted not to run candidates against those Kometo candidates in 2021. Uh, because of local politics in Osaka and deals that were being made um, on Osaka issues, um, Kometo had a walk to win those four seats. This next election, they are not going to have a walk. The Ishin has said they're going to contest all these seats. Um, and Ishin is on is actually on the upswing. So when uh, Keiko mentioned that the Kometo was worried about losing seats if they don't have some cooperation with the LDP, it's in places like this, the single member districts where they have to go against Ishin and um, their own supporters are not enough to win. Okay, a um, couple more slides. So who is Ishin? I think this uh, this party is new enough to most uh, people who follow Japanese politics that you should be curious um, who, who this party is. It's been around for about 10 years in various incarnations. Um, it has always been based in Osaka. And I think it's best treated as a populist party, a party that's um, trying to run against the elites. And this is colored in the Japanese context by the strong feelings Osaka people have that Tokyo has way too much dominance in Japanese society. They dominate politics, they dominate economics in recent decades, and Osaka is left behind. So Ishin has built its support in the Osaka region by saying we are going to stand up for Osaka, and this gets them a lot of support in that region. On other topics, they are remarkably eclectic. 
Okay, they're they are challenging the LDP from every direction. On economic issues, they run on the libertarian side, calling for deregulation and balanced budgets and not wasteful spending and these kinds of things, which are um, kind of popular positions in Japan, even though they are, some people would regard this as the conservative position. And um, then on issues like civil unions uh, for, for gay uh, couples, um, the party is open to supporting uh, civil unions. Um, along with uh, other opposition parties. It's one issue on which the LDP is isolated. They have said, we don't want any kind of uh, civil unions for, for gay people in Japan. And um, again, I, the Ishin is choosing the popular position. I don't know if this is populist exactly, but they're choosing the popular position against the LDP. And national security, they're running from the right against the LDP, saying we want constitutional revision even more than the LDP does. We want a stronger defense even more than the LDP does, and we will stand up for Japan. So it's a very interesting party in that this platform, if you pulled the, the package, um, and actually some political scientists have pulled the package of issues like this, they tend to find that the on the all these issues, the Ishin is more popular than the LDP's positions on these issues. But Japanese voters, uh, they also find, um, in the end, vote for the LDP because uh, it's the party that they have uh, look, trust a little bit more, I think, to govern because of their experience and uh, having seen them manage affairs over a long enough period, there is a hesitancy to trust a newcomer party, especially after the DPJ was seen as having uh, performed poorly between 2009 and 2012. So the, uh, I'm not going to talk about these in any details, but one reason why Kishida probably hesitated to hold an election this summer is that in the spring, we saw Ishin do fairly well in the local elections. Um, and uh, the uh, LDP is worried that the, this was an upswing that might continue. And then there was also some examples of when there was a fail failure of cooperation, when there was a three-way race, sometime the Ishin candidates we're coming in first um, in governor's races and by-elections um, in Nara um, and in Wakayama. So these are prefectures near Osaka. But you can start to see that Ishin is becoming popular enough in areas outside of Osaka prefecture itself where they can win single member districts. And this is causing the LDP to be nervous that they're going to lose in more places. So um, this is a, just a summary slide. On the one hand, Kishida has the opposition parties where he wants them competing against each other. The LDP is very likely to win the next election because it's not facing unified opposition. But what Kishida is worried about is that he loses too many seats to be regarded as the uh, uh, someone who should be reelected party leader next September. If, um, I don't know where the media will draw the line. Keiko, this would be my question for you. Um, I think he can lose 20 seats. The LDP can lose 20 seats. Kometo can lose five. And maybe that would certainly be enough to maintain the, the coalition in the lower house and might be enough for him to continue as uh, to be selected as leader. But if he loses more than 20 seats, and starts to flirt with, you know, really depending on other parties for majorities in, in uh, the uh, legislature, um, this gives Motegi an argument that they need a fresh face to, um, to lead the party forward into the future. Um, and Kishida will become just another minnow, and um, the, the uh, Motegi will try to be the next whale. So the last slide I'm not going to talk about is uh, my faction chart, which uh, you know some political scientists still maintain. Um, how many members are in each faction? So uh, Keiko gave you some numbers. She mentioned that the Abe faction um, is the largest faction with 100. And you can also see my color coding here. Yellow is for people who became prime minister. And you can see the Abe faction's dominance over the last two decades in holding the prime ministership for the LDP, uh, one person after another. 
So the fact that they haven't had somebody for two years um, in this office is starting to bother the Abe faction members, and they're they're ha they're trying to run somebody um, if they can the next time. But if Motegi gets there first, then um, they will have to wait a longer number of years. And so this may be why Hagiuda and some of the Abe faction members are starting to prop up the Kishida faction, at least for a little while, um, so that Motegi doesn't uh, jump the queue and that they can preserve their spot. So that finishes uh, my remarks, and I'm happy to go back to any of these slides if, if uh, people have questions. That's great, Len. Thanks very much. Uh, a, a lot of great context there, and I love that imagery of, of whales and, and minnows. Um, let, let me ask, uh, uh, pick up on some questions, if I may, and I'll try to sprinkle in some of what we're getting from the audience as well. First, for Keiko, uh, on the shuffle, um, uh, is the right way to look at this that this is simply sort of a tactical effort on the part of Kishida to a bump his public approval rating, manage factional balance, as you said, keep his enemies close to him so that they can't challenge him, or does it does it tell us anything about how Kishida intends to lead? In other words, for example. Is there evidence here that he's seeking to centralize more power, more decision making in the Conte, as an example, um, and that that's perhaps behind a bit the uh, the foreign ministry swap out? Um, I'm just I, I'm curious. In other words, are there any broader conclusions that we can draw from this about how Kishida wants to run his government, or is it simply a tactical domestic political play to boost his his approval ratings. Okay, uh, thank you for a great question. Uh, I think to, to, to be, uh, just put it simply, uh, in my view, you know, this is my personal view, but uh, I don't think that Kishida would like to lead like a, a dictator, or you know, uh, he doesn't want uh, uh, centralized power, but he, he and uh, in some areas uh, like uh, defense or um, yeah, the, the, let's say put it defense. Um, I don't think that he would like to commit too much to to uh, to create some nuisance uh, for uh, for him to go on. Uh, like Abe did, you know, Abe, Abe did a legislature for, uh, you know, very difficult uh, security uh, policy, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, admitting partially the uh, um, collective self-defense, you know, that, that was a really, really uh, problem for him. And he, he it just uh, uh, risked his uh, stability, his administration stability. I don't think that, you know, I don't feel and see Kishida's, uh, you know, any ambition to the challenge is something new, you know, uh, proactively to tackle. And rather than, you know, proactively e e addressing some something new, I think he is quite uh, focused or interested in uh, what's coming you know, like energy prices or my number card, you know, those those problems coming to him. So he's busy he's just uh, addressing those uh, problems, meaning that uh, he thinks that, you know, distribution of power is more uh, ideal and, you know, let uh, uh, ministries uh, tackle on uh, individual uh, challenges, you know, foreign ministry, foreign policy, and, you know, our finance ministry, finance. So I I think that, you know, it's rather uh, opposite that he would like to centralize his power, but he more maybe. Uh, so it's quite a, a opposite style, a different style from Abe, you know, ha having the Kante, the, uh, the uh, prime minister's office has a strong power to decide 
uh, you know, uh, many major important policies. Uh, he he is uh, more interested in distributing uh, power and maybe the responsibilities to each you know players. But but he but one thing is clear that he would like to uh, uh, go for the, the second term. So uh, in order to keep this uh, realized, I think he uh, preferred prefers to uh, maintain stability rather than you know instability challenging the very new things and uh, so so that's my answer is that an answer to you yep that's a great answer so this is more about sort of the distribution of power as opposed to advancing a centralized vision of of policy and um and direction so very interesting thanks right. yes um, thank you uh Len, I'll come back to you and, and Keiko, feel free to comment on this as well I, about a sort of the, again, the coalition dynamic here. Keiko said that it's it was the Komeito that came back to the LDP um, uh, after the divisions over candidacies in Tokyo, that Komeito needs the LDP for its success. Um, and I think, Len, you suggested the LDP still needs Komeito too. But on the other hand, it's clear that there is frustration within parts of the LDP about the degree to which Komeito restrains some parts of the LDP agenda. And I see that particularly on the national security front. Um, so how does this net out over time? You said we're stable until the election. Does that mean we're at risk of, of real change after that? How, how do you see this playing out um, sort of over a, even more of a medium term arc. And Keiko, I'm interested in your thoughts on that too. And then we'll try to get to some foreign policy questions. Mm -hmm. Len. So even this one has a foreign policy angle because of course the uh, Komeito party has historically been relatively pacifist. They have prided themselves on being the party that defends article nine. And um, they did uh, go along with Abe's constitutional reinterpretation as part of the coalition. Um, but that was, you know, um, they were kind of dragged along with what Abe needed to do. And um, the members of the LDP, no doubt, feel uh, frustration that every time they need to do something, they have to um, drag Kometo along on this issue. So part another part of the context is that the Kometo voting base is aging. Okay. This was a party that got its big boost in the 1960s when lots of rural people moved to the cities and um, they didn't have a, a social base. And so they joined the Soka Gakkai religious group and became Kometo supporters. Um, many, many of these people are now in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, um, the dominant group within Kometo is this group of, uh, of, of women members of the Soka Gakkai who devote a lot of their energies to uh, turning out and and mobilizing Kometo voters uh, in response to the directions from the Kometo leadership at every election. But when, you know, once these, these women are in their 80s, they're much less um, energetic enough to, to do that kind of mobilizing. And some of them are, are are passing away. So we do see that the total number of votes going to the Kometo is shrinking. So their value to the LDP is uh, declining, uh, looking forward into the future. And so even though they were completely indispensable uh, for the last two decades to win, for the LDP to win seats in urban areas, um, over time, the LDP may think that they, they, they uh, would be better off choosing some other urban partner. So that could be Ishin, okay? Ur Ishin is urban. Um, they have this huge support in Osaka. So if the LDP were to combine with them at some point, um, they would again be unbeatable, uh, the Ishin plus LDP combination. Um, so this, and because Ishin has a, a, a hawkish position on national security issues, the LDP, um, my, uh, no doubt, sees it as a uh, fallback option for the future. And Kometo is made nervous by the fact that they, they see this happening. And in the Osaka area, where Kometo is the other major party, uh, Ishin is eclipsing them, and they have a lot more younger supporters. 
um, Ishin voting base is uh, includes lots of energetic young men who are feel strongly about national security and like the the macho image presented by the uh, Ishin leadership. Um, I don't know if macho is the right word, but you know, uh, gruff, manly uh, politicians that they can they can support. So that's a part of the context for why the Komento coalition will be vulnerable going forward. And the most obvious way it would happen is if the LDP did so poorly um, at, a, at a future election that after the election, it decides Kometo is dispensable and says we need to switch to a new coalition partner. That would give them three or four years to start to cooperate electorally with that new partner. So change because of Japan's election system of single member districts, where parties need to cooperate in lots of different districts across the country and, and choose one to get behind. This is not a nimble coalition maneuvering that, that happens in the Japanese political structure. It requires time and 20 years that parties, Kometo and LDP have won, run together. They run before the election, they coordinate and then they govern together. This is a kind of coalition stability you've seen rarely in any other country in Europe, for example. Uh, even long part-time partners, the only one is the CDP, CSP of uh, the Christian Democrats and the Christian Socialists in Germany basically uh, become a single identity. But um, very few other partnerships are that enduring. Great. Okay. Thank you, Len. That was that was terrific. Keiko, any thoughts on on uh, on this? And then I'll close with a foreign policy question because um, we're running short on time. Right. right. Um, right. I, I think I would just like to uh, touch on um, exporting uh, defense equipment because uh, Kometo is you know, uh, deeply related to uh, deciding uh, Japan Japanese decision uh, on this. And so um, Japan has uh, three principles on the transfer of defense equipment and attached to the, uh, this principles is a implementation guidelines that, uh, uh, that uh, designate five areas as rescue, transportation, vigilance, surveillance, and mine sweeping. So the exportation, uh, export must be limited uh, in this, uh, within these areas. But uh, the LDP advocates the transfer of defensive weapons, uh, such as surface-to-air missiles, uh, for Ukraine, uh, which is subject to aggression and a violation of international law. And uh, and that would, uh, the LDP thinks, uh, or the people who support this idea uh, uh, think that um, this would uh, help the U.S., who is you know, running out of uh, uh, these defensive weapons and uh, uh, ammunitions. So um, maybe LDP advocates that the easing of this uh, implementation rules. But the Komeito has maintained its position of the uh, of these five areas, and uh, and because they they argue that they are the party of uh, peace. So and so if. Uh, they expect the election is coming near. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, Komeito will uh, agree to go for uh, easing uh, the, this uh, principle, uh, not the principles, but the implementation uh, rules, guidelines. So, uh, and uh, the LDP and Komeito have been discussing the issue uh, earlier this year as well. Uh, but Komeito has been really cautious and no conclusion uh, was reached yet. But uh, Kishida uh, uh, called for the resumption of the talk, talks uh, uh, in August. Uh, but uh, at, at, at that moment, unfortunately, Kishida did not give a deadline to the discussion. So I think the Komeito is taking advantage of that so and prolonging the discussion. So. Uh, I don't think that this will uh, this issue uh, will uh, 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 go for uh, um, make uh, progress uh, in any future. Maybe uh, before the election, 
So it matters when the election will come. Uh, but so in my view, uh, this is my conclusion, the only way to ease restrictions uh, to allow the export of ammunition, ammunition and other uh, goods uh, uh, as US hopes uh, for Japan, uh, I think uh, it would necessary for President Biden to uh, apply a so-called uh, external pressure, uh, you know, the good old gaiatsu uh, to Prime Minister Kishida. I don't think that the Kishida is, uh, as I said earlier, uh, Kishida is trying to uh, tackle some controversial issues uh, proactively, and this is one of the issues that Kishida would like would not uh, prefer uh, to uh, go for uh, it. So I think the the uh, the, the best advice for uh, the U.S. is uh, uh, is to uh, for President Biden to talk to Prime Minister Kishida that uh, discussion should be uh, expedited and uh, and Japan needs some uh, result. Uh, uh, I'll stop here. Very interesting, Keiko. Keiko somewhat somewhat disappointing, but it has always felt to me that this is the part of the national security agenda that that Kishida just does not have his heart in, uh, and that that's reflected in the in the drift that we see. So you see more drift coming. Okay, we're, we're a little over time, but I, I just would invite each of you to comment briefly on um, whether the shuffle, what current dynamics in the in the LDP uh, signal any change at all in um, some of the, the foreign policy priorities that Kishida has demonstrated. I'm thinking in particular of the relations with the Republic of Korea. I know a few months ago there was um, some resistance in parts of the LDP to efforts to improve ties. My, it, it seems to me that that appears to be largely gone, but interested in your thoughts on that. Uh, and then on China, there has been in the last few months, I know some entertainment in the Conte about how to sort of um, engage China more, more to stabilize the relationship. Some talk of a Kishida visit to, to China is a possibility just wondering your sense of how the political dynamics we've been talking about influence China policy uh, in the months ahead. Um, just quick answers, if I if I may ask you, Keiko, can I start with you on this one and then finish with Len? Okay, uh, thank you for a great question again. Um, well, basically, I don't think that there will be a big change uh, uh, to uh, on uh, the ROK uh, uh, the. The policy toward South Korea and China. Uh, basically, uh, uh, Kishida is would like to uh, revive uh, the Sino-Japan relationship, obviously, uh, and that would boost uh, his administration as well. Uh, so domestically, so but uh, there are some problems, including the uh, the treated water issue from Fukushima, and uh, I don't think that that will. Um, you know, it, it, it would need some uh, time. It would take some time in, in order to stabilize the relationship. So it would not take, uh, it would not be happening uh, too soon, but basically there would not be a, a, a big change. And I, I think that, you know, the appointment of Kamikawa uh, as a foreign minister, uh, th that's a good uh, news for uh, South Korea because uh, uh, Kamikawa-san's performance or the uh, the history on for, foreign policy, I don't think that he, there's not too much, you know, too much to see. But uh, uh, it's uh, I heard that you know she is uh, uh, very much interested in uh, improving the relationship between uh, South Korea and Japan. Uh, so I, I think it's a good message for uh, South Korea. So uh, I I would hope that that would uh, do something good to the foreign policy. Uh, I'll stop here. That's great. We we haven't really talked about Kamikawa Sensei, so that's a helpful perspective. That's great, Len. Any uh, any brief thoughts on on this question of foreign policy and China and South Korea in particular? Well, um, I agree with um, what Keiko offered on the topic. The one thing I would add is that it's interesting. One of the most surprising. Uh, moves in the cabinet reshuffle was was uh, replacing Hayashi with Kamikawa. And really, if um, Kishida wanted to do anything bold or interesting on foreign policy in the next year, 
you would have thought he would have kept Hayashi in the job. He is very experienced, has great connections with all these leaders, and, and shares many of the kind of inclinations to try to improve relations with both South Korea and China. So um, the fact that he dismissed him, I mean, I'm both. it's interesting that both of these are from um, Kishida's faction. So I'm sure a big part of his thinking was I need to give one more member of my faction a high visibility position to reward them while I have a chance. And it could have been, it had nothing to do with foreign policy that he would replace one with the other. But I do think that Hayashi's um, departure reduces the possibility of a bold move such as we're gonna announce tomorrow that Kishida is going to China. Fascinating, Len. Yeah, I, um, I, I think the the departure of Hayashi was certainly the most surprising thing about the shuffle, and I and I certainly agree. It uh, suggests I, less uh, ambition. Yes. Yeah, please, uh, Kiko. Just Last one, word. one thing. Yes, about the reshuffle, and you know this uh, the foreign minister uh, uh, Kamikawa and the newly appointed uh, defense minister Kihara. You know. Uh, Kihara is a, a you know, uh, expert on uh, defense policy, but uh, he's a first first ap appointed uh, minister. Uh, so we, you know, their experience on security and foreign policy area is uh, virtually unknown. You know, their their performance. So compared to uh, Hayashi and uh, ha uh, Hamada, uh, you know, combination, uh, the previous combination. I think you know it's uh, there. There will be some um, know, un uncertainty uh, about this appointment, and uh, and with regard to defense uh, expenditure, you know, which was you know, increased drastically uh, this year, uh, I, I think that the Kihara's Kihara sons uh, would need a lot of political you know maneuvering or you know uh, i don't think that it, it might be uh, too heavy for kihara san to uh, manage this and and compared to hamada san and uh, hayashi san uh, you know that that was a very strong combination of uh, politicians to deal with foreign policy and security policies so uh, we will have to see uh, this uh, uh, kihara uh, kamikawa and kihara combination will work out uh, yeah, stop here. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. And that was sort of behind my question to you about what this says about sort of Kishida's leadership vision by replacing two experienced people on the foreign policy and defense policy front with two newcomers. Uh, so we've exceeded our time, but I think that reflects the, the, the range of topics here that are so interesting. So my sincere thanks to both of you. Keiko Izuka and Len Shopa, really terrific conversation. I'm I'm grateful for your time today and look forward to having you back at some point. So thank you. Thank you and so much. That, we'll... Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. And with you. that, we'll bring this to a close. Thank you all for joining.